My name is Hani Farid. I'm, uh, I'm the faculty here at UC Berkeley, and I'm going to be talking today about uh, detecting deepfake videos. And the work that I'll be talking about is primarily that of Shuti Agarwal, who is a PhD student with me here, really terrific, actually, PhD student uh, here at Berkeley. Uh, so let me start by just talking a little bit about what these deep fakes are. I think you've probably heard about them, but let me just make sure we're all sort of on the same page. It's a generic term that has been used to describe what is probably more accurately referred to as computer synthesized uh, imagery. So, for example, if you navigate to this website, thispersondoesnotexist.com, um, you will see images like this. Each of these people, you can see across gender and race and age and with glasses and with earrings and with facial hair, do not exist. Uh, they are whole cloth synthesized by a computer. And unlike the classic computer graphics synthesis game where you build a 3D model with texture and virtual lighting and a virtual camera and then you do the rendering, that is not how these are made. These are made with a different underlying mechanism and before we talk about detecting things like this and the corresponding videos, let's just talk a little bit about how they are created to make sure that we understand the underlying mechanism. So there's lots of ways of creating deepfake images and videos. I'm going to talk about one in particular that I think is particularly powerful and relatively easy to understand. And it is so-called generative adversarial networks or GANs. So for generating an image of a person who doesn't exist, for example, what you do is you start with a random image. And when I say random, I really mean that you splat down a bunch of pixels um, at whatever resolution you want. Um, and that is the generators, um, one uh, part of our module here, first pass at an image of a person. That image is passed to a discriminator who has at its, disposable, at, at its disposal a bunch of images of people, actual people scraped from the internet. The job of the discriminator is to, well, discriminate. Can I build a discriminator that distinguishes this synthesized image from these actual images of people? And of course it can. This is a trivial task. And so it goes back to the generator and says, nope, you have not generated an image of a person um, that corresponds to this uh, category here. And you can see, by the way, the category could be anything. It could be cats, airplanes, houses, cars, whatever it is. And then they iterate, a um, so-called generative adversarial network, because it's generating something. It is adversarial because you're pitting the generator against the discriminator and network, of course, because both of these are deep neural networks. And after enough iterations, it will eventually generate, uh, by modifying pixels, an image of a person that, when it is passed to the discriminator, looks an awful lot like these people, and then the game is over. Okay. So you can see how this is very different than the classic computer graphics rendering. There's no 3D modeling. There's no notion of, of geometry or lighting or camera or anything else. It's simply a data-driven approach to generate an image that categorically looks like other things. Now, you can use that same basic structure to do other things. So, for example, I can take the likeness of this actress, Jennifer Gardner, and I can change her appearance to be that of, because the Internet is what the Internet is, Steve Buscemi. This is an example taken off of a, taken off of a YouTube video. The game is pretty similar. The job of the generator is to change the identity of this person to that person right there. And so it modifies some pixel, it sends it to the discriminator, and the discriminator, again, has access to a bunch of images of Steve Buscemi, the actor, but it also is trying not to do two things. Not only is it trying to change the appearance of this person to this person, it wants to make sure that the head pose and the lighting is consistent. So it wants the identity to be this person, but the overall appearance, that is turning the head down and to the left, to be that of this, so it has a dual problem that it's trying to solve, does that again as a discriminator, and with enough iterations again within this GAN, you can change the identity. This is a so-called face swap deep fake. It's only one of several different ways that you can make this, but you can see again why this is powerful, because if I do this frame after frame after frame after frame in a video, I can literally change somebody's identity without a lot of hard work in something like a Photoshop or an After Effects or the classic special effects that you might have um, had to do historically. And when you do this frame after frame after frame after frame, what you get is a video that looks something like this. I expected Amy to win. So I, I just like, it was just, I, this, was, this was very truly surprising for me. Um, yeah, I, I was just really surprised. 
Uh, Sheridan Watson from BuzzFeed right here. Hi. Um, so you're a huge Bravo fan. Oh, Who yes. was your favorite and least favorite housewife of all cities? <laughs> um, my favorite is probably Lisa Vanderpump. Um, my least favorite... I don't want to have to say. I mean, I don't want to have to say, because who knows when you're going to run into these people, you know? Now, that deep so-called face swap deep fake, uh, this one right here, is only one of several different categories of deep fakes. So the face swap deep fake is kind of where you replace one person's face with another. Um, there is a so-called puppet master deep fake where you take a single image of a person, static image, and then let's say I am now going to be the puppet master, so I would look at a camera and I would move my eyebrows and I would talk and I would move my head and it will animate the person, the entire head of that person. They are the puppet and I am the puppet master. Um, Hao Li at uh, University of Southern California has done some really beautiful and impressive work in this space. There is a third type of deep fake called a lip sync deep fake. Um, you've probably, or if you haven't seen it, you should look it up. There's an Obama Jordan Peele, which is the classic example. And here what we do is we take the full video is whomever you'd like it to be. Mark Zuckerberg, for example. We take a new audio track of an impersonator or a synthesized voice. And all we do is synthesize the mouth of the person to be consistent with that new audio track, hence the term lip sync deepfake. So in a lip sync deepfake, we're modifying the mouth to be consistent with a new audio track. And a puppet master, we're whole cloth generating the audio and how the head and the face and everything moves for any individual. And in the face swap deepfake, we're replacing just this from about the eyebrows to the chin. But you can see that in every case, we can change what somebody is saying and what somebody is doing. And I think you can probably see why that is a fairly powerful technology with some really entertaining and fun applications, but also some uh, darker consequences. So let's talk about that first. So today, where we are seeing the most use of this type of so-called deepfake technology is in the creation of non-consensual pornography. The likenesses of primarily women are spliced into sexually explicit content, and that content is distributed online. That can be everybody from famous actresses to journalists, human rights activists, or people who just attract unwanted attention from those on the internet. Um, I think this is a major uh, and serious problem at a very individual level, and something that we as an industry and as a society and regulators have not come to grips with just yet. Obviously, we are living through massive misinformation and disinformation campaigns online surrounding COVID, surrounding Black Lives Matter, surrounding elections, surrounding the census, surrounding all events that are happening around the world. And these types of deep fake uh, videos and audio injected into already a misinformation campaign uh, has the potential to create even more disruption to our online ecosystem. I have historically worried a lot about digital uh, imagery in terms of evidence in a court of law. And obviously, if I can manipulate an image of a person saying or doing something that poses a threat to our judicial system. Obviously, on the national security level, we rely on visual imagery all the time to make incredibly important decisions. That is a threat. And of course, there is the threat of fraud, people uh, pretending to be somebody who they are not trying to extort money from you, personal information, or whatever it may be. I would argue the bigger threat here, these are very concrete things, how you can see deep fake technology being used to, uh, uh, in, in nefarious ways. There is in some ways an overriding threat here, which is the so-called liar's dividend. That if we enter a world where any image, any video, any audio can be easily manipulated and distributed, well, then everybody has the ability to say, well, anything that is out there is fake, so the so-called liar's dividend. And that, in some ways, is the larger threat here, that if we enter a world where anything can be fake, well, then nothing has to be real. And how do we reason about the world? How do we have a democracy if we can't agree on basic facts on what is going around in the world? And this is the landscape that faces us as we enter uh, the upcoming election, for example. And so we have been thinking here in my lab, uh, Shruti and I have been thinking a lot about how you detect these types of deep fakes. And right now we're primarily focused on um, high profile people, presidential candidates, presidents, people who, when if we create a fake video of them, it can, for example, change a national election in the United States or in Europe or in South America, for example. And so what I wanna do is talk about two different techniques 
uh, that we've been developed focused on detecting uh, deep fake videos. And by way of motivation for the first technique, let's watch this video and see if you notice anything. Hi everybody. 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 Now what you probably noticed there, those are all clips of former President Obama uh, starting his weekly address. And what you probably notice is, hi everybody, hey everybody, hi everybody. He has this little sort of head tilt he does. And you may not have noticed, but as he comes down, he purses his lips ever so slightly and he starts to talk. It's a tell, it's a, a behavioral tick or mannerism, if you will. And we all sort of do it to some degree. The way I raise my eyebrows when I emphasize something, uh, the way I, I, I move forward a little bit when I want to emphasize something. I mean, we all have slightly different ticks, and what we're going to be in the business of doing in this first technique is modeling these, what we were going to call soft biometrics. Not something that distinguishes you from 7 billion people in the world, like a fingerprint maybe, or an iris, or your DNA, but maybe that something can distinguish you from an impersonator, a deep fake. So, for example, uh, here's a single frame of, uh, from one of President Obama's uh, weekly addresses. And down here, what I'm plotting is time on the horizontal axis. This is about 10 seconds, so about 240 to 300 frames at 24 to 30 frames a second. And what I'm plotting in the graph are two things. Uh, in blue is the uh, head motion around the horizontal axis, so in, as if I'm nodding in the affirmative. And in orange is the amount that I'm turning down the sides of my mouth. And as if I'm frowning. And what you see here, these are averaged over many, many 10 second clips, is that they tend to be correlated for President Obama. So that is when he frowns, when he's upset, he tends to turn his head down ever so slightly when he is frowning, and vice versa, tends to tilt his head upwards um, when he's not frowning. It's a really interesting correlation. Now, when we create, for example, a lip sync deep fake, this is just one frame of a lip sync deep fake. Um, what have we done there? Well, we've decoupled his mouth from his head. So his head in the original video is saying whatever it's saying. It's happy, it's sad, it's neutral, whatever. And then in the mouth, though, which was taken from a synthesized um, audio, it's doing something else. It may be frowning, it may be smiling, it may be neutral, but it certainly doesn't know what the head is doing necessarily. And so now you can see in this graph that we've decoupled them, that pattern of correlation is violated. Yeah. Now that's President Obama's, one of President Obama's tells, one of his mannerisms. It's not true for everybody. So for example, here we have a, a one frame of a video of President Trump, and here again, time on the horizontal axis, and now in blue, I have the chin pucker, how much I'm puckering my chin, and in orange, I have how much I'm opening my mouth, like this. Okay. Now if you watch the President talk, you notice that he has both of those very distinct mannerisms. And what you can see from this graph is that they are anti-correlated. They are, they are when one, when the mouth is open, the chin doesn't pucker. And when the chin puckers, the mouth is closed. Okay, good. This is a face swap deep fake that we made of President uh, Trump using Alec Baldwin's Saturday Night Live skit. So underneath it is Alec Baldwin impersonating Trump. Very funny. Um, and we splatted President Trump's face onto Alec Baldwin. And here you can see that Alec Baldwin didn't quite do something right. What he does is he opens his mouth and simultaneously he puckers the chin. So he took this sort of this, this, this characteristic of President Trump and he exaggerated it, but he didn't get the dynamics right. And so in, in both of these cases, lip sync deep fake and the face swap deep fake, we've discovered a violation of this behavioral mannerism. Now, in the face swap deepfake, fundamentally, the person you are looking at is not who it purports to be. This is not Jennifer Gardner. This is not, sorry, Steve Buscemi. It's Jennifer Gardner. So her face and her facial expressions are moving like her, not like him, even though it looks like him. In a puppet master, same thing. Vladimir Putin is there, but I'm controlling him. My, it's my mannerisms, whether I can mimic him or not, who knows. And in the lip sync deepfake, I've decoupled the mouth from the head, and so I'm, I have the potential for violating some of these behavioral mannerisms. Instead of, so instead of going specifically after an artifact that may be introduced from one of these or many of the future things, we're going to go after something more fundamental about a deep fake, which is that in this case, it's just not the person. It's not them. It's the way they're moving is not them. 
And here, we've decoupled certain mannerisms between the mouth and the rest of the head. And the benefit, of course, of this technique is, first of all, we can hopefully detect any of these types of deep fakes, but also we're not specifically tailoring our technique to a specific GitHub repository for creating a specific type of face swap. We're going after something more fundamental about these videos, which is it is not the pur person it purports to be. Good. So let's talk about how we detect uh, deep fake videos using these behavioral mannerisms. And so the first thing we do is we start off by tracking the face. So let me go ahead and just run this video and then I'll come back and talk about it. So in that video, what you saw is just open face tracking the face. We get the blue bounding box that tracks the three-dimensional um, head pose. Uh, the red dots on the face, of course, correspond to the tracking of all the features. And the green lasers coming out of the eye tell me um, eye position. Uh, from that face tracking, we extract 18 so-called action units corresponding to different facial expressions. So we go from this low-level representation of where all the features are to a mid to high-level representation that tells me um, how much are you frowning, how much are you smiling, how much are your eyebrows lifted. 18 of them, um, standard action units. And we measure two head movements, rotation of the head up and down as, as if I'm in the affirmative, and rotation around the z-axis, um, tilting left and right. We ignore this rotation around the vertical axis because when politicians speak, they tend to look around the audience and it tends not to be diagnostic, so we're just going to ignore that head rotation. So I have 20 measurements that I make on every single frame of a video. And for now, we're going to analyze 10 second uh, clips the way I showed you in the previous slide. So from those 20 measurements, um, I get those curves that I showed you for Obama and for Trump. And for all pairs of 20 choose two, so 190 total, of action units and head movements, I measure the correlation. Are they, are they correlate, highly correlated, highly decorrelated, or not correlated at all? I get 190 measurements for every single 10 second clip. And now what we're going to do is look for diagnostic characteristics of an individual. So what I'm showing you here is every single data point here corresponds to a single 10 second video clip from one of the individuals that you see enumerated here. This was of course done during the Democratic uh, primary before Biden and Harris took the nomination. Each color corresponds to an individual. So for example, these down here are Obama, uh, Harris, Hillary Clinton, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and so on and so forth. This, of course, has been the original 190 dimensional features have been projected into this two dimensional space. And you see something very interesting here, which is uh, the clusters are very tightly coupled, showing that there is consistency within an individual. And those clusters are separated from everybody. Uh, these dots here labeled FF that are scattered around are random people from the face forensics database. Um, so that's not one individual scattered about. But all these other ones are each individual person. Now, how does this help us? Well, uh, let's say I want to determine if a video of President Obama is real or not. I build this cluster. Uh, maybe I put a, a, a hypersphere in the, in, in the form of a support vector machine um, around in the 190 dimensional space. And anything that falls within that, it looks like Obama. Anything that falls outside of that is not Obama. So for example, all of these down here are the deep fake Obamas. They are lip sync, puppet master, and face swap deep fakes. But notice that fundamentally, this is not really a deep fake detector. It's a Obama detector. It's a real Obama detector. What we are saying is, whatever the mannerisms are, I'm not, I can't really say that they're not Obama. I, sorry, that they're, they're a deep fake Obama. It's just that it's somebody else. It could be an impersonator. It could be Hillary Clinton. It could be anybody. But in that regard, I don't care. I mean, in fact, I consider that a feature, not a bug, which is that I'm going to tell you whether this person is moving, whether their, their mannerisms are consistent with what we've seen before. And if they are not, well, then either they're not Obama or they are a deep fake Obama. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about um, some of the, the analysis we did to verify the efficacy of this approach. So we built a pretty large data set. I'll give you some numbers in a minute of, of Obama. That's super easy to do. Go to YouTube, scrape a bunch of videos. You can get hours and hours and hours of the former president. Uh, we created some, uh, we, we um, uh, were given uh, some lip sync deep fakes from our friends up at the University of Washington. Um, we downloaded a bunch of uh, videos from YouTube of an impersonator. Um, again, whether they're deep fake or impersonators, I just want to be able to detect that. We then created face swap deep fakes 
using that impersonator. So we put President Obama's face onto the impersonator to create a face swap. And then how Lee and his group down at U University of Southern California created a bunch of puppet master deep fakes for us. So we have all the different puppet um, deep fakes and one impersonator set. And now we want to ask is how well can we distinguish real Obama from these types of non-Obama? Okay, so let me tell you how I'm going to present the results. So we have 207,000 plus 10 second video clips of Obama. Uh, we have 2,308 10 second video clips of a comedic impersonator and a total of just over 17,000 deep fakes from face swap to lip sync to Puppet Master and then 30,000 just random people from the face forensics database. So I want to, I, if, if, if I'm right and I've built the, that cluster that distinguishes Obama from everybody else, I should be equally good at, at distinguishing him from random people, his comedic impersonators, and his so-called deep fakes. I'm going to present the results here on the vertical axis in terms of AUC area under the curve. Chance performance is 0.5, uh, 50%, and perfect classification is 1.0. All right, so for 10 second video clips, um, you can see that our performance, except for lip sync, and I'll come back to that in a minute, is above 0 0.9, um, oh, getting close to 0 0.95. Uh, you can see that the puppet masters are the best, um, slightly better than everybody else, and you can see that we're struggling here. We're only slightly above 0.8. Not bad, but not nearly as good as the others. So first of all, why is that? Why are we struggling here? Well, we're looking at behavioral mannerisms across the whole face. and Think about the nature of a lip sync. The only problem with a lip sync is that you've decoupled the mouth from the rest of the head. So the eyebrows and the head movements and the, you know, the squinting, those are all consistent. It's just this. And so this should be harder because a lot of the video is, is correct as compared to the face swap in Puppet Master where the whole face is something else. Okay? So that sort of makes sense. Now, that's the accuracy for 10 second clips. Average videos are a couple minutes long. So if we just do a little bit of averaging and we do a majority rules um, and look at the entire video segment, we can push the AUCs upward quite a bit. So here in the Puppet Masters, we're close to one. Face Swap, we're close to one. Comedic Impersonators are close to one. And Random are just below one. And here you can see we got a nice little jump. We're up in the low 0.9s for the lip sync deep fakes. Okay? So we're doing pretty good now in distinguishing real Obama from not Obama, including the deep fakes. Um, now, I should say, uh, although I don't have the slide for this, that we can improve the lip sync deep fakes by forcing the features, the pair of features that we measure, to always have one on the mouth and one on the rest of the head. So if we prune that 190 dimensional space, I can get a little bump in performance. Okay, now, so that's the basic idea. We're gonna use behavioral mannerisms as a soft biometric to detect deep fakes or impersonators. Now everything we did is sort of old school handcrafted features, right? And obviously today um, in the field of forensics and pattern recognition and computer vision, more this, this type of approach would typically take a more learned approach. Now one of the nice things of what we did, however, is by looking at these high level features, first of all, we know what's happening, we have some intuition, and we didn't latch onto some low level pixel level feature that would be very easy to uh, destroy by transcoding the video, downsizing it, or simply using an adversarial machine learning to do that. So those high level features, particularly over time, are very powerful, but almost certainly looking at correlation of 20 uh, measurements is not going to be optimal. And so now we wanna ask ourselves is, well, can we do a little bit better? And let me just talk a little bit about that. So what we're gonna do is not a fully learn some artifact that is the difference between uh, deepfake videos and real videos. Um, by the way, I should say one of the other advantages that we've done is we only need videos of the real person. I don't have to build a huge data set except for evaluation of all the different types of deepfakes to build my classifier. All I need is authentic videos and that makes life a little bit easier. So, but now we're gonna try to uh, use a little bit of machine learning to improve on these features um, that we are using for behavioral mannerisms. And it's gonna go something like this. We're going to start with FabNet, this very nice work from 2018, that extracts a uh, appearance-based representation. So we're going to start with uh, uh, 100 frames. So we're going to shorten from 10 seconds to about 4 seconds of video. 
Um, this helps with the computational demand, and it's actually nicer to work with shorter segments because you can do more analysis. You can you can break up the video into smaller and smaller chunks, and then average over uh, more segments. So we're going to take each of 100 frames, and we're going to shove them into FabNet. And out of FabNet comes a 256 dimensional vector that encompasses the appearance of the person. Okay, not explicitly action units, but just a generic appearance-based representation. Okay, so for example. If I queried FabNet with each of the images that you see in this column, and then I looked at the nearest neighbor, what you see is, well, it's actually not the same person, but the appearance is the same. That is the head pose. So here you have somebody sort of with their eyes partially closed looking forward. Uh, down at the bottom, you have somebody at a bit of a profile. and You can see that the nearest neighbors, in terms of this 256 dimensional representation, look similar. So there is no identity here. This is an appearance-based um, uh, representation. And you can see that you find things that are similar in appearance. Now, that's not quite what we want, but it's close to what we want. Okay. So we're going to take that and we're going to augment it in order to be able to do behavioral mannerism. Let me describe how we do that now. So first, let me remind you, we got 100 frames. Each go into FabNet. Out comes a 256-dimensional uh, vector. We pack that into a 100 by 256 matrix um, that embodies the appearance on each frame of this video. Okay. Now, we're going to take that and we're going to shove it into a what we call our behavior net, um, which is trained on just a couple of details here on VoxCeleb2 dataset. Um, it's a ResNet 101 architecture and we use objective metric learning. I'm not going to get into all the details of this. They're all in an upcoming paper that is available on my website. But out of this comes a 512 dimensional vector that embodies um, the appearance and the identity of the individuals that you see uh, that are in the input. So what do I mean by that? So here again is um, the input image. Uh, one, uh, these are going to be sequences. I'm going to show you these videos in a minute. So this is a little uh, four second uh, sequence, four second sequence, four second sequence. And what I'm going to show you in the video in a second are the nearest neighbors in this representation here, not the fab net, but in the behavior net that now is going to do two things. It's going to learn both identity, how is the head moving, and who is this person? Who is the identity? And so let me go ahead and play that video. And I think what you'll see is that our nearest neighbors are both the same person from the full box celeb data set and the way they are moving is similar to the input video. So let's go ahead and look at that video. Okay, so what you should have seen there is that we now in this behavior net representation, again, the details of that I've not described, they're all in the paper, embody two things, the identity of the individual and the mannerisms. How are they moving? Now, it's not the same mannerisms in terms of action units, um, but it is a learned set of uh, mannerisms that, were, that the behavior net, of course, was trained to do using that metric learning that I described in the previous slide. Okay, so that's one pipeline. Images come into uh, 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 FabNet. They come into our behavior net that learns to find uh, the behavior and the identity. Now, we take those same individual uh, frames of the video and we shove them into a standard face recognition. We just use BGG face. Um, and out of that, each of those comes a 4,096 dimensional representation. We pack that into a matrix. We average those because, of course, those representations should all be the same because that's the same person in the video clip. And we get a single representation, which is who is this person based on standard face recognition features. So this is a behavioral recognition, and this is a facial recognition. Now, in an authentic video, what do you expect? Well, if I have a data set for this individual, or President Obama, or President Trump, or Vice President Biden, um, or whomever it is, well, then I can learn this representation for that person, just the same way that I did in the previous handcrafted version. I can learn this representation for the person. And what I'm going to do now is for a probe video, I'm going to push it through this pipeline. I'm going to get this representation and this representation. I'm going to compare it using a cosine or Euclidean similarity, whatever you want, to the reference set. And two things are going to come out. So one is, um, if it, this is the behavioral components of the person I think it is, well then, 
the person you find in the reference set, the person closest person should be that person, and the facial identity should be that person. And if those two identities match, well then the video is authentic. If the face matches what's in the reference set and the behavior matches what's in the reference set, well then it's that person. And if it doesn't, if the face matches one person but the behavior uh, matches another, well maybe it's a face swap deep fake. Or maybe it's a puppet master deep fake, or maybe it's a lip sync deep fake, or maybe it's just an impersonator. And so these two pipelines allow us to match behavioral with facial and make sure that they, in fact, match. And again, this reference set here only has to be built from authentic videos because we're not actually looking for specifically fake. We're just looking that this is not the person it purports to be. All right, let me tell you a little bit about evaluation. Um, we evaluated on one, two, three, four, five data sets. Um, this is our previous data set from the, the first set of the results that I described. And these are public uh, 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 databases. This is Face Forensics. This is Facebook's and Google's uh, data sets here. And what I'm plotting these is the number of identities and the average duration. So for example, our data set has a huge um, average duration, but very, very few people. Face Forensics has lots of identities, but very short. And then these databases are somewhere in between. So the combination, there's lots of different individuals, thousands and thousands of them, and varying degrees of the lengths of the video available for each one. This plot shows you, these are the ROCs for the different data sets. This is the overall average, and then this is the various data sets that I enumerated before. Um, I've highlighted the crossover of the ROCs. So the purple is real, the cyan is fake, and you can see the crossover is 97%, 96%, uh, 99% rather, 93%, ooh, 88%. We took a big hit there. I'll come back to that in a second. And 98%. And the average is pretty good. So on average, uh, this technique, and I'm not going to do a direct comparison to the earlier version where we did handcrafted features, but I will tell you that these are doing significantly better than the handcrafted features, but still in spirit doing the same thing, which is looking at the temporal mannerisms and behaviors of individuals and making sure that they match what we have previously seen. So why did we take a big hit here? 88% is a crossover. Not terrible, but significantly worse than what you're seeing up in these other data sets. And there's something interesting with this data set, and it's, we basically found a bug in the data set. So here's one example of that, of that bug. This is the source video, and this is the target video, and this is the face swap. So the face swap was supposed to take the source and put it into the target. So this person right here should look like this person, and it doesn't. <laughs> it looks like a blurry version of that person here. And so basically what happened in this data set, this is the pre-release of the digital forensics uh, 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 challenge, um, was that some of the videos just didn't work. Um, the, the, the face swap just failed. And basically we detected that because when we analyzed this video, it looked like that person and it had the mannerisms of that person and we said it's real. And it was. I mean, as far as we're concerned, it's the same person. And that's just because the face identity didn't swap for a number of the videos, hence we took a little bit of a hit there. Okay, so that's the first technique. Uh, basic idea is you get a bunch of video of the people that you want to analyze. Um, obviously, we can't do that for 7 billion people in the world, but we can probably do it for dozens to hundreds of people. You uh, extract these uh, temporal mannerisms and, of course, facial identity, and you simply look for matches and mismatches as a way of identifying deep fakes. Same intuition as the first part of the talk. It's just that we use these learned features instead of these handcrafted action units that we manually uh, extracted. And when you do that, things improve a little bit as you, one would expect. All right, let me talk about the second technique. Um, this is some really beautiful work that Shruti Agarwal uh, has done over the last year. Um, and it, it was motivated by the fact that we were particularly worried about the lip sync deepfakes. Um, when you build face swap deepfakes and puppet master deepfakes, you're changing a lot of the video. But when you make up a, a lip sync deepfake, you're changing a very small portion of the video. And that really is just forensically, you can see why that would be a big challenge because a relatively small part of the video is being manipulated. And we wanted to think very, very specifically about those types of deep fakes. What I'm showing you on this slide is uh, a mapping between phonemes, the sounds that you make. So MVP is mother, brother, parent. Um, FV is favor or victor. And what I'm showing you are the visemes, the shape your mouth makes, at least for the English language, when you say these particular phonemes. So when I say mother, brother, parent, try this at home. Um, I won't be able to see you. 
Um, try saying mother, brother, and parent, and don't close your mouth. Mother, brother, and parent. I, I, you can't do it. And if you're a ventriloquist, good on you. Other than that, you can't do it. Same thing with favor and victor. Favor, victor. Your lower lip curls in a little bit and your teeth come down. There's a certain shape that your mouth makes when you make certain sounds. And we hypothesize, after looking a lot of some of the very good lip sync deep fakes, is that sometimes these phonemes, busy matching, aren't quite right. And the reason, of course, is that when you think about the nature of the synthesis, they don't have explicit 3D models of the mouth. It's all data-based, and you know, a little um, a, a miss here or there is not particularly noticed when you're watching a video at 24 or 30 frames a second. Um, but um, when you slow it down, I think you can see something. So go ahead and watch. I mean, this is, is going to be a slow motion video of President Trump saying, I'm, as in I'm a, I'm this. And I'm going to slow it down for you and watch in particular how his mouth moves. Okay, what you should have seen there is the mouth actually entirely closed. Now watch this video. This is a lip sync deep fake of President Trump again saying I'm, as in I'm a, and, and you're going to hear an S at the end. It's an I'm so, I'm so, and I'm going to bring in that S sound so you can see that we've carried you all the way through the M phoneme and, and see what happens um, in, in this slow motion video. All right, what you should have seen there is that the mouth didn't quite close. So this is the last frame of the real video saying I'm the phoneme M, and this is the last frame of the lip sync deep fake I'm, and you can see that the mouth didn't entirely close. And what we found is that it's not always the case in the lip sync deep fakes that the phonemes don't match, but about a third of the time, there is a mismatch of an M, a B, or a P. Those are the only ones we've looked at right now. We're currently looking at other phoneme busy matching. And that's actually quite a bit, because in a three-minute video, that MBP sound is pretty common. And eventually, with one-third of them not being right, you're going to trip up, and we're going to find a mismatch between the phoneme and the visine. I won't give you the, the, quanti the quantifiable um, results we have there. That's all in the paper, also available on my website, which I'll give you at the end of the talk, and you can go look and see how we do that. But we do pretty well at detecting um, those uh, types of lip sync failures in terms of phoneme visine matching. So let me just finish this talk with a couple of thoughts, if I may. So what are the challenges we are facing in the, the space of uh, forensics and deep fakes and misinformation? So arguably, one of the biggest ones is just the rapid development in machine learning. There is a huge number of people working in this space. And just about every three months, we are seeing rapid advances in GANs and machine learning and the optimization and data sets and the ability to synthesize images and videos. And that's a huge challenge for us forensically because we are constantly playing catch up. In addition, there's a huge challenge here with the scale and the speed of social media. And then in particular, once these things are being created, whether they are non-consensual pornography or videos meant to interfere with elections or sow civil unrest or interfere with voting, they are being uploaded to social media and, social media and being spread at a speed and a scale that is un precedented and that is a huge challenge for us because the half-life of a social media post is measured in hours not days and not weeks and not months which means that you have to be able to work at a scale and a speed to stop the spread of this information that is incredibly challenging so even if we had great technology we still have a huge challenge here um, we have a particularly polarized public today not just here in the United States but around the world which means that not only can you create the stuff not only can you distribute this stuff, but you can have a willing audience that is not only eager and willing to believe it, but is eager and willing to help spread that mis- and disinformation, and that poses another challenge. And again, I want to reemphasize this liar's dividend, that as we enter a world where you can create images and video and audio of people saying things they never did, and you can, you can pollute the online information ecosystem with that, we are going to, if we have not already entered a world where everybody can simply dismiss inconvenient facts. And I would argue that's a fundamental threat to our society and to our democracy. Okay, that's a little doom and gloom. What can we do about it? Well, a couple of things. Uh, the Facebooks of the world, the YouTubes of the world, the Twitters of the world, and the TikToks of the world have got to get more serious about their responsibility on how their platforms are being weaponized against individuals, societies, and democracies. We got to quit screwing around and pretending that this is all fun and games, 
that we are just a neutral platform. We are not. Facebook and YouTube and Twitter al algorithmically amplify mis- and disinformation, and they profit um, from that to the tune of billions of dollars a year, and they have got to start taking that responsibility more seriously than they have over the last decade. We have to stop, in my opinion, and I realize that um, you are not here to push back on me, but we will have a Q&A, and I welcome the pushback on this. We have to find a balance between speech and safety. Um, I think this idea that everything goes on the internet doesn't work anymore. We have seen that. Um, so I think we have to move away from talking about this as a speech versus uh, stifling speech and talk more about it in terms of reach. You may have a fundamental right to post material online. We can, have a, we can have a reasoned and I think thoughtful discussion about that, but you don't have a fundamental right to have Facebook and TikTok and Twitter and YouTube's algorithm promote that material to billions of people around the world. So I think what we should be talking about are the underlying recommendation algorithms that decide what should everybody see, hear, and read on a daily basis. 70% of YouTube's videos that are watched are promoted by YouTube. They're not a neutral platform, they're a publisher, and that of course is true of all the social media platforms. They are maximizing engagement, and they prioritize outrageous, salacious, angry, devices, divisive, and conspiratorial because it's good for business, and I think that's what we should be talking about. Not that there aren't serious issues here to be talked about, but we should also be talking about the underlying algorithmic amplification and recommendation algorithms. Obviously, from an intervention, we've got to talk about technology. Corporate responsibility, talk about the regulatory space, talk about the, the algorithms, but we also, of course, have to talk about better moderation algorithms, whether that's human or com computer moderation. And of course, we have to start talking, we are, most of us are educators, about how do we educate the next generation of digital citizens and get them to understand how to be better digital citizens in terms of how they engage and how they extract trusted information. Okay, um, I think I promised somewhere in the middle of the talk that there's lots of papers on this that we have published and more. You can find all of those on my website, fareed.berkeley.edu, under the Digital Forensics tab. Um, there's a deep fake section, lots of papers. Um, both the techniques that I talked about here, the behavioral mannerisms and the phoneme visim are on there, plus a number of other ones. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to hearing from you in the question and answer.